a New York Times bestseller author, best-selling author, Andy Andrews. Oh, wow. there we go. Wow, wow. Look at him. Look at them all. That, that was supposed to be for me. The clap was supposed to be for me. And what, a nice, what a nice studio you guys have. I've never actually done this in a hot tub before. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We also have the CEO of Yellowhammer, BJ Ellis, on board as well. I, I had a double take when BJ walked in. He's wearing a suit. Good <laughs> for you. Looks great. I, I have a couple. Oh, thanks. Thanks for the one clap. I yeah. appreciate that. Hey, look, look, I promised you guys yesterday how great this was going to be, and I'm just going to go here and say that this is going to be the best segment all day. You're, you're right. I, I believe you're right. Cause you are here. <laughs> <laughs> Not because of me. You're here. And then on top of that, Andy Andrews. So Because it, we have the Andy Andrews. Well. Yes. And we're excited because he came in with a box full of books, and he yep. gave them to us. And I did read about this upcoming book, and it really sounds fascinating. It's The Little Things, Why You Really Should sweat the small stuff right so you go against everybody's you in fact you go against grandma's old adage yep. don't sweat the small stuff i do i do it's it's amazing how that has become a mantra in society today yeah. and and you know you can google uh proverbs or or wisdom and find that but, but a lot of times you find that conventional wisdom not only is it a little skewed sometimes it's not even the truth and that mm. is the case with this. Uh, you know, I started several years ago having some just amazing successes with, with clients, with some corporations I was working with, with some teams, and, and just shocking, like doubling in, in a year and this kind of stuff. And, and I, I, I started dialing in to find out exactly what's happening here. And, and I found in every single case, it was little things. Now, we live in a society where people are all about the big picture. You know, people say, well, we got this new guy and he's big picture. Well, you know, some of us know that sometimes your guys with the big picture have no clue all mm -hmm. the intricate details it takes to yeah. make that big picture happen. And, and so it, it, when you look at life itself, it, it's like a masterpiece, like a painting when Leonardo da Vinci did the Mona Lisa. He did it with the smallest paintbrush that had ever been used at that time. And today in the Louvre, if you go and you put a magnifying glass up to that painting, you cannot even discern individual brush strokes. And so with our... With our lives, with our businesses, with our families, at the, at the end of it all, uh, whether you have created a masterpiece or a disaster, it will have been done one tiny moment, one tiny brushstroke at a time. Gosh, that's, that's overwhelmingly scary. You, you know, it, it, it is in a way, but in a way it's comforting because you don't really have to know everything you don't have to it's so many little things make a massive difference you know the book came out yesterday and i was i was kind of amazed to, i'm always amazed to hear what parts of the book people start talking to me about and i've had so many people talk about there's a there's a chapter talking about one sixteenth of an inch and a little thing like a sixteenth of an inch and and just the story of how i, I was with a buddy one time we were out in the gulf of mexico and we ended up miles mm -hmm. away from where we ha had intended to go. We were going 100 miles out. We are going to okay. catch tuna. And the, we'd set the, the autopilot on this little boat. And, and, and the autopilot, we, we ended up missing everything. We were stranded out there, out of gas. And, and it's, it was shocking because when we left Orange Beach, Alabama, you look back and it, it all seems the same. Yeah. But, you know, an auto, autopilot is a compass. There's 360 degrees on a compass, and when the when the compass was surveyed later, they did the mechanical survey on it. It was it was two degrees off. Well, two degrees off is just a sixteenth of an inch. And so when you're talking about leaving and and moving in a direction, you can't even discern the difference. But you get a hundred miles out, you're you're six seven miles away from where you had intended. Now, if that happens in a negative way, obviously you can harness it to do it in a positive way because people think that they have to make massive changes for for big things to occur but they don't it's little tiny shifts in behavior little tiny shifts in action that that make the massive difference long term so it is achievable when you boil it down to the small brush strokes yeah and easy to see 
and easy to see. That's 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 a good point. So out of that, from the book, what would be one of the little things that you found or you write about? Yeah, here 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 here's a here's a good one, Andrew. You, you know, <clears throat> and I I got to tell you, this is, you know. Me, I, I am. Uh, I realized several years ago that if I was going to make a living as an author uh, or or a speaker or whatever, that that I had to have results because I have no celebrity. I, I'm right. I, I don't. I'm not. A, I don't have a Super Bowl ring. I don't have a gold medal. I wasn't a hero in some national, you know, tragedy or something. But I, I'm a dad. I'm a husband. Uh, I'm a business guy. I'm a friend. And and so at the end of the day, if if somebody is going to engage me, I have to have provable results. And because I'm a nobody, i got to have great results. I, you know, I can't help somebody just increase 15, 17 percent because they, it would be too easy to say, oh, we had a good year with Andy, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure we couldn't have done that without him, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I had to have some doubles and triples and that kind of thing. And so when when I started dialing in and realizing that that these things could make a provable massive difference and I could and that the CEOs would sign off on it. I mean there's there's one there a, a company I worked with um, they had been in business for 19 years and I've worked with them now for 2 years. But 19 years to get to 5.4 billion in business. I'll tell you who it is, Fairway Mortgage. Okay. Uh, nine, uh, five point four billion in business after nineteen years. I engaged with them, and after a year, they did eleven point something billion. And then this mm. past year, they finished at seventeen billion. And and they didn't go acquire a bunch of companies or anything. It it is a way to compete in a fashion that your competition doesn't know there's a game going on, mm. because everybody competes the same way. I don't care what industry you're in. Mm. I don't care what game you're playing. Everybody competes the same way. If you go to an insurance guy and say, "Say uh, uh, we're, we're shopping insurance on our car. Can, can you give me some?" And, and he'll tell you the price and the product and the service and the your rates and da da da. And you go to another guy and ask the same thing. You'll realize he's saying the same thing. It may be a different name of the product. It may be a slightly different price, but he's saying the same thing. You know, every co football coach in America. Uh, from mini mites to the NFL, there's not a one of them who, at some point during the season, doesn't say, "I need everything you got from the snap to the whistle." From the snap to, the, give me a hundred percent from the snap to the whistle. Well, it, that's true. You do need everything from the snap to the whistle. But the problem is, the coach on the other sideline just said the same thing. Yeah, that you is know. True. And so, so the 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 challenge is, you do have to be good at the fundamentals. But if you really are better than them. And, and all you pay attention to are the fundamentals. The best you can hope for is to beat them every time by a little bit. But if you figure out how to legitimately compete, not just from the snap to the whistle, but also from the whistle to the next snap while everybody else is just standing around, mm -hmm. you'll run them off the field. Mm -hmm. and, and this is done in, in specific little ways. And it's always, always, the, the big difference is always made in something that the clients, the potential clients, uh, even the competitors don't even think is your business. Hmm. Does like, that make sense or am I? Am you no, know, that's great. It's, you uh, basically apply this biblical principle about being faithful in the small things and then that leads to others. So I, I kind of like how you, you laid that out in your argument because I think people, oh, I want this great thing to happen. I want to be great in these things. Well, you got to be faithful each day. Like if you want to be healthy, you got to eat healthy every day. You got to exercise. Right. If you want to clo grow closer to God, you got to pray. You got to read the scriptures. You got to go to church. So, but we, sometimes what we want is this great experience, like financially or spiritually or emotionally. And we just think it's just going to happen. Well, mm -hmm. no, you got to be faithful in the small things daily, and then that stuff can happen. And here is here is an edge on that, Chris. You're right. You're absolutely right. You have to be faithful in the small things so that the big picture can be completed. But what small things are you being faithful in? Now, see, see here is a, here's a curious thing that when we were little, and this is in the book, and, this, and I can explain this pretty quickly, but it's more detailed in the book. Okay. But, but um, it, when we were little kids, we had one thing knocked out of us early on, and that was the question, why? 
Right? I, I mean, our parents say, don't ask me that. You're driving yeah. me crazy. Don't, yeah. don't ask me. Yeah, I tell my kids that all the time. Don't, <laughs> don't, ask, me. don't ask me that about anything. And so, by, so by the time we get to be uh, adults, you know, we're, we're not asking why. But we do continue to ask why at a certain point. And here is the point. You start looking at this. When do we ask why normally? We ask why when it's not working. See, we're all competing the same way. We're sailing along, number one, number two, number three. We're all kind of in, in and out of that same position. Or, or like, when all of a sudden we take a dip, well, now everybody's concerned. We go, why is this not working like it was? Why is this not happening? Like, why is, why is the business fa falling off on Thursday afternoons? Why is this not, you know, you, and, just, and then when we find the answer, uh, we bring it back up to that same level. And we're going, now, uh, now things are cool, and we don't ask anymore. All right, here's, here's the key. Here's the key to competing at a level. The competition doesn't know there's a game going on. The key is not just to ask why when things aren't working, but to ask why when they are working. Why is this working like it is? Why is this happening in this way? Why are people responding in this manner? Because here is the bottom line. You can find any number of people who know how to harness a principle. They know how to do it. They know how to take that principle and harness it and make it work. But until you know why a principle works, you'll never be able to take the full power of that principle and harness it in different areas that seem to have no, no relation to the original thing that everybody else is using it for. Mm. So it's not enough just to know, know how a principle works and know how the business works but the the small few number of people see I, I would argue with you that coach Saban not only knows how the things he do he knows how they work because he's gone through years of coaching and he has taken all this time but he knows why certain things work as they do mm -hmm. and he can apply them in different areas wow <laughs> <laughs> mind that, blown it is <laughs> I do have a question about you you mentioned this not just knowing how a principle works, but why. And I'd like to ask you a personal question about that when we come back from a break. Awesome, awesome, okay. All right, so we're going to go to break, and we'll be back with Yellowhammer Radio. You're listening to Andy Andrews, New York Times best-selling author. He's in studio with us today, and we'll be back in just a minute. Yes, thank you, Big Dave. We are having a love train right here because we're talking some really important things with Andy Andrews. Uh, you're you're listening to Yellowhammer Radio. Andrea Tice here. I have some co-hosts in with me, Chris Reed from Reed Law and uh, Yellowhammer CEO B.J. Ellis. But the main thing we've been talking about is with Andy Andrews and his new book, The Little Things, what we, why we really should sweat the small stuff. And you left off by talking about the fact that it's not just important to understand how a principle works, right? but why. All right, so my personal question to you is can you give us a, a, an idea or an illustration of where this came to be in your own life where you understood a principle and then then you how you dug deeper and then found out why yeah yeah this is you, you know digging deeper and finding the foundation of something is is so absolutely critical and I, I found in the in working with the the coaches and the teams and the churches and the organizations that I work with, to get massive results. Now you, you got to understand, most people don't. Even in first and second place, people don't get massive results. They get consistent results. But there's a difference in consistent results and massive results. There's a difference in increasing 15 to 20 percent a year for a decade and doubling a couple or three years in a row and continuing to increase 50 percent a year. Yes. Right. Right. And so so when you when you look at that, and you, you figure out like where does that come from? Where where is that that found? I have found the thing that stops more people than any other thing is the fact that that uh, that people don't understand that something can be true and not be the truth. This is very curious now, mm. all right? They're, they, but most people don't understand that because they they don't understand that, it, well, when, when I talk about something can be true and yet not the truth, we stop at what is true. We stop. When we get the answer, 
Okay, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's the answer. Okay, but the truth connotes a bottom line. Can, you know, when, when in Dothan, Chris, when I grew up, we used to go to Azalea Pool. Chris mm -hmm. is from Dothan. I lived in Dothan. And, and we'd go to Azalea Pool, and every afternoon we would play this game. After we got sick of Marco Polo and all these other games, we, we would play this game we called Dolphin. And there in the middle of the pool, we would get in that deep end, and we'd all tread water, and Flipper was on. At that, at that time, I did, which, Andrea, you're too young to no, know. No, I, we I do remember. <laughs> Lassie in a wet I suit. might be the only one <laughs> here. <laughs> but well, we would, we, you know how Flipper would get up on his tail and get out of water? That was what we would do. We were, the game was to see who could get up the highest. Well, Eric Perry always won. He always won because he was older than us. He was big. He had big hands, big feet. He always won. Uh, but until the day Kevin Perkins just destroyed him in front of everybody because we, we were all used to Kevin uh, you know, being like us and used to Eric winning. But when it was Kevin's turn, he got in the middle and he said, are you ready? And we're like, yeah, go. Is there, you sure you're ready? Yes, go, Kevin, go. Yeah. Well, he went down. And we, we were, we're kind of treading water and looking. So what, what is he doing? And he went all the way to the bottom and then he kind of squatted down. All of a sudden he pushed off the bottom and he came rocketing out of the top of the water and we had a new dolphin champion. And we were like, Oh, my gosh. And, of course, a couple of kids said, you cheated. You cheated. And I said, really? I cheated? Where, where's, the, where's the rule that says I can't go down before I go up? And we're like, well, okay, well, uh, okay, that's not a rule. But we get to do it, too, right? <laughs> and yeah, you get to do it, too. So we had a new way of doing it. And, and the point is that until we planted our feet on that concrete foundation, until we went as deep as we could possibly go, we could never harness the power that was available to to go the other way. Now, it, it, when I when I talk about somebody something can be true and yet not the truth. If we took a blind person and we said, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you to this uh, animal. I know you had never heard of this animal before, never uh, had it described before, but the animal is called an elephant. We can give you a few minutes with this animal, and I want you to tell us what an elephant is like, and then tell us how it can be used." And a blind person might spend a few minutes with it and come back and say, okay, um, uh, an elephant is very, very tall, very wide, very flat. And they could, they could be used as a, a barrier, probably a gate, maybe uh, several elephants as a wall. Okay, that, well, that would be true. It would all be true. It just wouldn't be the truth. Because until you got to the truth, until you got to the bottom line, until you covered everything about an elephant, until you got to the bottom line about an elephant, you couldn't possibly have a complete picture of what an elephant was like, or you couldn't possibly harness all the many ways an elephant could be used. What you knew was true, and you got benefit from it. You could, you could stop right there. You had a wall. Okay. okay. And so in so many areas of our life, we stop at what is true. And... Don't go on to what is the truth. Hmm. And there's so many. There's, you know, in parenting, uh, and in in business. Uh, you know, people talk about one of the things that that I always see clients kind of like sh they they quiver when I say this when we start. But if I'm talking with a business client, um, and, and I, I'll say, hey, you know, this uh, customer satisfaction that you're really on right now. And I say, yeah. I said, it's totally, totally ineffective. And they go, really? And I say, yeah, the customer satisfaction thing, that's, uh, that's just, uh, that's not where you want to be. It's uh, kind of, it's, uh, it's not going to help you. And people are like, really? I mean, cause, you know, I, and I'm kind of teasing. They'll mm -hmm. look at me like, I think we made a mistake here. But, <laughs> but, but, but the truth is, here, here, see, see, customer satisfaction, is it important? Yeah, that's true. Okay. I, is it the bottom line? It's not nearly. And let me, let me tell you this. If you want to compete in the marketplace, well, compete with customer satisfaction, compete with price, compete with product. That's what everybody does. That's how everybody competes. But if you want to compete in a way that, you're, that the competition doesn't know there's a game going on, you have to understand that customer satisfaction is the lowest bar you can possibly hit and still stay in business. Anything below customer, anything below a satisfied customer, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yep. so so this satisfied customer thing, to to understand, I mean here, you know, here's a satisfied customer. Hey, did everything go good? Yeah, it did. 
So there's something deeper yeah, than there customer is. satisfaction. And I'm, and I'm gonna tell you what it is. I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna blow your mind with this next one. Oh boy. Okay, so okay. we have to we're up against a hard break. So we're gonna come back. Boy, do you know how to do a cliffhanger? <laughs> <laughs> You're listening I mean, to Yellow this'll make this will make you a lot of money. Okay. <laughs> All right. Andy Andrews You're listening to Yellow Hammer Radio and we are with in Andy the Andrews. House. New York leaving Times us with a cliffhanger. He's leaving us with a um, cliffhanger. I'll we'll be back. Uh, Hang in Chris there. Reed and BJ Ellis, just for the sake of being, <laughs> okay. you know, <laughs> polite. He's trying to be nice. To you. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. But now let's get back to the story. Yeah, okay? Back to Andy. All right. Okay. You guys be quiet. <laughs> All right. Um, Andy Andrews, you left us hanging because we asked about not just learning the how of a principle, but the why. Right. Right. And it's it's one of the it's one of the most results-oriented thing in this new book. This new book it just came out yesterday. Brand new. First book I have released in four years. And and honestly, I wrote it because I was afraid. I, I mean, I, I realized a couple of years ago or 18 months ago, I thought, man, if I croak, I have two two boys. I, you know, we have a 14-year-old, 17-year-old. And if I croak, my, my boys will not know how this stuff happened and won't be able to harness it in their lives. So I started detailing it. And, and the, the customer satisfaction part of this is, is very curious because, as we said before, you know, the customer satisfaction is the lowest bar you can hit and still stay in business. That's right. That's where you left us. Yeah. You were, you were saying if that's all they shoot for, it, it's, it's not enough. Right. I mean, anything less than a satisfied customer, you're in trouble. Right. Okay. And so most people, they take that as their highest bar. And yet, if you, if you look at... What really is a tipping point to uh, competing in a way the competition doesn't know uh, games going on? That means you're getting all the business, man. You're getting all of it. And, and so, so how does that happen? How would, it, how would it turn that, you know, why, what would be going on if everybody, if you were just so overloaded with business, well, it, it would be a function of word of mouth, right? I mean, what, mm -hmm. what do we say is the greatest advertising? It's word of mouth. No question. And word of mouth is so powerful that if your word of mouth is incredible, then your competitors cannot possibly traditionally advertise in a way that could overtake your word of mouth. Right. And if your word of mouth is horrible, you cannot spend enough money mm -hmm. in traditional advertising to turn people around if your word of mouth is horrible. Now, what most people don't understand is that with customer satisfaction, most word of mouth is neutral. Because if you ask a satisfied, you know, you say, hey, I know that you just bought a car from so-and-so, and we're getting ready to buy a car. And it's, how did everything go there? Yeah, it's good. So everything smooth? Yeah. So no problems or anything? No, it's good. Well, there's your satisfied customer. Because, see, as a, as a customer, you, you, you know, down deep in our souls, here's what we're thinking. I better be satisfied. I paid sure. for it. Mm -hmm. I paid for it. Sure. You know? And so, so, so what you're after, you're not after satisfied customers. You're after raving, lunatic, mm -hmm. admirer, fan. You know, it's just like I am with Yellowhammer News. I am a screaming teenage girl, uh, a fan of Yellowhammer. I, everywhere I go in the country, I talk about this entrepreneurial story. I tell it from stage. I talk about it on other radio shows. I, and I tell about you guys and these guys that are young and they're vibrant and they're just kicking butt and they've just taken over. And, and, I, I, and see, you know, it's not just, yeah, we got a lot of radio stations. See, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. All right, now here's, here's the thing. Here's what I want you to understand. To create that, to create that kind of thing, it is never price or product, ever, mm -hmm. never. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in fact, if I ask, I mean, we take a thousand people in a room, and I say, raise your hand if you have ever paid more for a product than than you had to. You know, you could have gotten it less somewhere else, but you chose to pay more. Everybody raise their hand, and then we say, okay, how many of you have gone to more trouble to get a product? You could have gotten it online, but you chose to wait a week and drive across town to get it. Everybody raise their hand. Okay, for people who consider themselves fairly intelligent, that's an incredibly stupid thing to admit. Mm -hmm. Really, I, I know I could have gotten it for less and less trouble, but I chose <laughs> to go to more trouble <laughs> and pay more of my money for it. Really? Really? And yet, there was no collusion. We all came to that 
that that uh, conclusion together. I mean, I mean, separately, we all decided we would do that, and we're going to do it again, and we'll do it the rest of our lives in in, in instances. Okay. Now, here's the thing: they all have in common. Every single one of those times that we did that. It didn't have anything to do with price or product, obviously, because we paid more. It went to more trouble. It had something to do with the person mm-hmm. that we were getting it from. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It had something to do with a, a loyalty we were showing or a, or a gratefulness that we were showing. Yeah, I know Walmart's across the street. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, I know I could get it cheaper. But let me tell you what she did for my grandmother 15 years ago. And I will always go there. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah, I know my, I have a farm. I, I know I, I passed seven pharmacists to go there. But. But when I go there, I am thanking this guy because my, my boys are 14 and 17 now. But when my boys were four and five, when, when we would go into that pharmacy, that pharmacist would come out from around the counter and he would shake hands with my four-year-old. And he would say, Austin, look me in the eye. Come on. Come on. Squeeze, son. Squeeze. Now, look, look. Now, what do we say? Nice to meet you. Good to see you. There you go. There you go. I mean, listen, in a world where... I, nobody is ever going to hire my kids because they can high five or fist bump, mm-hmm. and 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 I need my sons to learn how to shake hands like a man, and I can't be the only guy in town doing it. Mm-hmm. And so every time I would take my boys in there, that he would do that. He would provide that for me. So I'll always take my 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 pharmacy business to them. See, see, we're showing gratefulness, showing that. That loyalty. Now, here's the thing. If you understand how that happens, you can create it. Because the bottom line is, I don't care what industry you are in. I don't care what industry you're in. The product is you. Mm. The product is you. The difference is you. Okay? And it turns out the word of mouth and, and, and what you become and what you are being, these little things. And I've got a ton of them in the book. And these little things that you create out of you that make that massive difference. Let me tell you, let me tell you something. We're wanting word of mouth, right? Okay. I, I, I would honestly tell you that traditional word of mouth is so powerful that traditional advertising is nothing in the world but a tax you pay for not being remarkable. Mm-hmm. I, That's interesting. I've got a, uh, I've got a question, something that I face like in my business as an attorney okay. with clients. And it sounds like you're going to, you have a great answer to this. Um, something that I deal with is sometimes people have this, what I call a hope deficiency. Right. And it's just, it's not that they don't have the ability to make the choices that you're talking about. It's like I have to spend so much time getting them to actually believe and like have some hope that they can get better. How do you deal with that whenever you have, let's say, a business client or somebody, and right. maybe they're just really struggling with that hope issue? How do you get them to, one, overcome that and then to succeed? Because that's what I struggle with sometimes to get my clients just to believe enough for them to achieve what I need them to achieve. Right. Boy, that's a, that's a great question, yes. Chris. And we all deal with, it, with that in one form or another. Youth, <laughs> youth, people who work with youth deal with that. People who work with clients like you do work with that. We all deal with that. And, and it is a common malaise throughout society that people – People tend to 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 not. Here, here, here's here's something very curious. We talk about perspective. See, these people have a slightly negative perspective on their on their lives and mm-hmm. on their possibilities. Yeah. Right. And and there there are two things going on here. They're little bitty things, but two things. One is our society does not understand responsibility. Now, we hear about it all the time, but there's two different sides to the argument that are so far apart. One side says, until these people accept responsibility for where they are, these people are never going to be able to accomplish. And you got the other side going, but it's not their fault. Don't, don't you know what his mother was mm-hmm. like? And yeah. if your mother was oh, like that, right? Yeah. Two different sides. Neither one of them really have a clue as to what responsibility is. See, responsibility is not about blaming people for where they're from or what they're going through or what, you know, where they are. Responsibility is about hope and control. And who among us doesn't want to have hope for a greater future 
that we can control. Now, if it's somebody else's fault, if it's your mama's fault, if it's the president's fault, I mean, if it really, if where you've ended up really is the fault of the president of the United States, you might as well jump off a cliff now. Because mm-hmm. what the heck are you, you know, are we going to do about the president, whoever the president happens to be? Right. But if I can look in the mirror and I can say, I've had some crazy things happen in my life, and I couldn't change any of them, but I have made choices in response to those things that have led my life right down a path to a place I don't like. If I can understand and believe, I can make choices that will lead me to a place I don't like, doesn't it make logical sense I could also make choices that will lead me to a place I do like? Mm -hmm. So the key is make better choices. All right, now, here's here's the the cool thing. Are are we about to go to a break? Because if we're about to go to a break, I've got got the slammer here for you about how you can harness this in your life and the ultimate answer for you, Chris, on this. And with your kids, you see your kids and you want your kids to accomplish more and you feel like your kids don't have the hope that they should, we're going to handle this right after the break. All right. Let me me jump in here and say this. I love what's going on right now. I I have three autographed books in front of me, the little things. I love Big Dave. If you can call in right now, and tell Big Dave a funny joke to make his day better. Make him laugh. I will send you an autographed book from the man, Andy Andrews. But you got to make my guy laugh. You have to make him laugh. All right. Good job. So make those calls right now while we're at the break. 941-1011 if you're local. 866-551-9933 if you want to do the toll free. Stick with us. Yellowhammer Radio. We'll be back with Andy Andrews. Another cliffhanger. We'll be back. Hey, welcome back to Yellowhammer Radio, Superstation 101.1 WYDE. Andrea Tice in the captain's chair, but we've got a full studio. Andy Andrews is already getting people jumping in the studio, trying to get uh, to shake his hand and talk to him, and we're happy to have him on board. Uh, New York Times bestseller author Andy Andrews. And we again left with another cliffhanger. It's a perfect timing. You know exactly how to run radio here. Well, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, I think I think the most exciting life we can live is life where it is a cliffhanger. Every 15 minutes, you're learning something new. Now, and Chris Reed, our lawyer-in-chief, posed an interesting question on dealing with people that he, in his practice, that are deficient in a hope factor. Would uh-huh. you call yeah. it that? And he, you were asking Andy about... How to approach that? Help to ha- you want to see them instilled with some sort of hope so they can make some changes right. down the road. And so the first part of that, the first part of that is responsibility, because responsibility, taking responsibility, is the only way that you can personally manufacture hope that is built on something that is not built on air. Because it, it, and what I'm saying is, if it really is my fault, then I have a lot of hope because I can control me. I mean, if, if what I'm going through really is my wife's fault, I don't, I don't know about you. I can't control my wife. What are we going to do about my wife, right? But but if it, if it's my fault, well, I can control me. And I was telling you guys, you know, between uh, or when we were off the air that. That, uh, you know, I had a thing going on a few years ago with a friend of mine. We were kind of back and forth on some stuff. And I remember just saying, God, please, you know, I don't know the answer here, but please let this be me. Let this this be me. Because if it's me, I I can get after it this afternoon. We we can start changing this this afternoon. If it's me, if it's if it's if I am the problem here, then then please just please show me. And please, Lord, if you can, let it be me. Because if it's me, we'll get this fixed quickly. If it's him, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. And so, so people want to avoid responsibility, but all you're doing is, re- is avoiding any control in your life. You know, God has given you free will. Mm. And, and so you're, you're avoiding any, any control in your life. So responsibility is the first part of that. Now, here's the other part of it. The other part of it is perspective. We see people in a slightly negative perspective, a slightly glass half empty perspective. Now, here, here is something that's very odd. This is a, a little thing. We talk about this in the book. And, the, and again, this book, this is available on Amazon, is available, I mean, it's a hardback, less than 10 bucks. Come on, you guys. And, <laughs> and, and he's talking, by the way, about the new book that's coming out as of today. It's, yeah, yeah. The Little Things Why You Really Should Sweat the Small Stuff. Right. I mean, this is something I'm telling you. These interesting little tidbits that you can 
read at dinner time and talk with your family about it. Okay, talk about something productive. And so, so, but a lot of this stuff in here, this is not a rehash of some old, you know, rah rah stuff. This is dig in, understanding, learning some new stuff, and like, and, and like this here. And to answering your question here, when. When we look at perspective and what people have known is for years is that perspective, they think perspective is how you see a thing. It's, it's how you see it, whether you see it half empty or half full. The glass is half empty or the glass is half full. That's your perspective is how you see a thing. Okay. There's not a lot of control there. And yet, if you take responsibility for your perspective, think about this. Okay. Perspective is not necessarily how you see a thing. Perspective is how you choose to see mm. a thing. See, the glass being half empty or half full, as the, as the cliche goes, it, we set the glass there. The glass is what it is. It is what it is. It does not change whether you see it half empty or half full. The glass is what it is. Perspective is the only thing that can totally change the results without changing a single fact. Now think about this and we'll say it again. Perspective is the only thing that can totally change the results without changing a single fact. All right, the glass is what it is, right? And we all know that if somebody looks at that glass and they, they tend to, every time they see that glass, they're, they're kind of that half empty person. Okay, well, that kind of half-empty person, that's kind of a person that, you know, they're maybe a little whinier. We, we tend not to, not a lot of people want to be around a glass half-empty person. I mean, they, you know, they're not flocking to follow a glass half-empty person, uh, you know. And then on the other hand, glass half-full people, people who choose to see the glass as half-full, we follow them. They're in leadership positions. They make more money. They get more opportunities. They really do you can measure it. They get more opportunities. Why do they get more opportunities? Because people want to be around them. And so when people have ideas and people have opportunities to share, there's just more people around them. And mm -hmm. so they're hearing them, whereas the glass half empty people are not hearing them. And so the results of their lives totally change. But the fact to the glass, the, 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 not a fact changed, but the results change. Perspective, the only thing that can tell totally, me, give, give you a great example, a great example here. And, and remember, perspective is how you choose to see a thing. Mm -hmm. now, now, it's curious because it's, it's your thinking, right? You know, people think that people, people think that our choices determine where we end up. That's true. This is a great example of something that's true that's not the truth. We've heard from for years from speakers, from books that your choices determine where you end up. If you want to do something for your children, make sure they make good choices. Okay, well, that, that's true. Okay, but, but that's assuming that choice is the bottom line, uh -huh. and it's not. I mean, just saying make, make your children make good choices, most of us do that by going, hey, make good choices today. Have a good day. Make good choices. Make good choices. And then they come <laughs> home with a note from the teacher. We go, was this a good choice? <laughs> this was not a good choice, was it? Okay, you're going to make good choices from now on? Okay, go outside and play. Make good choices. It's like telling a kid, <laughs> take this quarter and go outside and flip heads every time. Flip heads every time. Hey, is that a tail? I told you to flip heads. And you would say, well, that's kind of crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. Because how would we, how could we possibly expect a kid to have any hope of flipping heads every time unless we as adults had figured out the process by which that is even possible and could explain it to kids where they could attempt it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same thing as choices. Just make good choices. Unless we know where choices come from, period, how could we possibly explain the thinking that, that gathers good choices? And so the, 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 uh, the, the deal is that it, the bottom line is not choices. It's not choices determine where you end up. It is your thinking. It is your thinking that determines where you end up in life. And, and if you ever doubt that your thinking determines your choices, you got to remember that every choice you've ever made in your life, every choice you will ever make is totally determined by what you think, how much you think about it, uh, how you thought, and what you decide you're not going to think about right now because you can't be distracted by thinking about what you got to think about to, so that you can decide. It's your thinking. <laughs> it's your thinking. Now, here's the beauty of it. 
God's greatest paradox is your thinking determines your choices, but you can choose how you think. Mm. You can choose how you think. Here's a, here's a great, great quick story talking about perspective and talking about how perspective is the only thing that can totally change the results without changing any fact. In the fast food industry, I've worked with a bunch of fast food people, and I worked, worked with Chick-fil-A for a number of years. In the fast food industry, the average fast food, this, this has been known forever, the average fast food restaurant, just take them all, lump them together, average them, grosses $800,000 a year. That's what the average one grosses. By far, Sunday is the biggest day to make the money. And so and that's, that, that fact has been there. That, that statistic has been there. You can see it. It's been there forever. Now, the people at McDonald's look at that fact that Sunday is the day the most money is made, and they look at that fact, and their perspective is that they choose is Sunday is a great day, to staff our restaurant as high as it as it can be, we got to roll these people through here. We got to have as many people working on Sunday as we can. We got to make hay while the sun shines. But Chick Fil A looks at that same fact, yeah. And they, their perspective is that Sunday is a good day to rest. Sunday is a good day to give everybody off. Now, here's the bottom line: is that the average, the average McDonald's does 2.5 million a year. The average Chick Fil A with 52 less days a year, does $4 million. All right. We have to <laughs> – this is so much. Hang in there. <laughs> Yellowhammer Radio, we got to go to break. Listening to Andy Andrews. Stick with us. Jesus Welcome back to Yellowhammer Radio, Superstation 101.1 WYDE. Andrea Tice here with a room full of gentlemen, Chris Reed, B.J. Ellis, and New York Times best-selling author, Andy Andrews. Nice, nice to be called gentlemen, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it is. <laughs> How, how's that? Let me ask you even, a question. Even with that trick you just tried on yeah. with <laughs> me yeah, in the middle of the break. <laughs> let, let me ask you a question. How does that make you feel when they say New York Times bestselling author and then your name? You know, it's, it is amazing. I, you know, cause it's got to be. I wasn't even the best writer in my senior English class. I mean, honestly. You know, and so I just – I, I – I have begun to understand some things that 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 can be harnessed, and you know, and one of those things that can be harnessed is I can get better every day. I'm still not, I'm not great. I, you know, I'm not a great writer or anything. I, uh, uh, but I, well, <laughs> false. Well, I, but, but look, here's the thing. I I started praying years ago, a number of years ago. I started praying, God, please help me understand things that you want your people to understand. That if they did understand, they would live the lives you want them to live, mm. Mm. which means they would have a relationship with you, which means they wouldn't be going to Oprah for answers or the government for answers. They'd be going to you. And God, give me simple ways to explain complicated things that are confusing your people. Mm. And I, I feel like that a lot of what I do is, is an answer to that prayer. Sure. That's that's strong right there. And I don't want to hijack this, but I have one more question that I have to ask. So I wake up every morning, some mornings at 5, sometimes at 5.30, and I, I have my devotions and I pray. And I pray for wisdom every single day, for Yellowhammer, for my family. And I'm like, God, you gave it to Solomon. You can give it to me. What can What can a person listening right now do to get the wisdom outside of saying, God, give it to me? I, what can I do? Obviously, read your book, which I'm going to read tonight, probably in entirety. But what can I do on a day? Like, you just said what you said. God, let me explain to your people what you want them to understand. From a wisdom standpoint, what can what can I or any listener do? Well, you know, now from from a from an intelligence gathering thing, you know, from an information gathering thing, we we read mm -hmm. and and we listen and we watch. But from a wisdom thing, see, wisdom is different from knowledge. Wisdom is right. different from knowledge and information. You know, I mean, uh, knowledge and information, we live in a society that is awash with knowledge and information. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, I mean, and, and knowledge and information, you, just like you could teach any 12-year-old to drive a car. Any 12-year-old you and I know has the mental and physical ability to learn how to drive a car. Now, if you taught them how to drive a car, you still wouldn't throw them the keys and say, have a great weekend. Sure. Because they don't have the wisdom to apply that knowledge and information in a consistent manner and, and in proper context. And so 
So while there there are ways to to uh, to to read and listen and make sure we're reading and listening the, to the right things, and make sure that we are also not reading and listening to things that we should not be mm-hmm. reading and listening. All right, mm-hmm. and, and 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 yet. I really believe, now this is probably not an answer you expected, but I really believe that a connection to wisdom, if we are reading, I mean, you can, you can read and you can, uh, you can pray and, and, and all like this, you, and, and you can watch and you can listen, you can be this, but we've seen some of the smartest people in the world are some of the most unwise people we've mm-hmm. ever seen in the world too. Yeah. And so... There is a connection to wisdom that I think that I have just, and I'm, I'm 57, buddy. I, you know, and I don't know everything. I, the older I get, the more I realize I have to learn. But I am also in a steep learning curve right now. And one of the most important things that I think I've learned in this past year is what you just asked, and that is a connection. How to take that knowledge and information? How to connect it to wisdom? And here is where I think the difference is made. I really think the difference is made in quiet time. Um, and and what I'm specifically saying is like, you know how, I don't know if you pray like I have prayed for years, is, you know, I, 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 I try to pray unseasonally. I try to talk to God during the day, but I also have a couple of times in the day that I sit down and I talk to God. But, but when I talk to God, and I've done this so many times in the past, you know, Lord, thank you so much, you know, praise you, Lord, and thank you for who you are in my life, thank you for your son, Father, Uh, Father, uh, thank you for my family, the health of my family, Lord, please, if you would watch over this, please, if you'd Mm -hmm. do this, and and Father, I'm concerned about this, and and, and I'd go through this litany of things, and I'd say, thank you, Lord, thank you so much, Uh, amen, and and there is, there is something missing there, and I didn't realize that it, it was missing for a long time. If, if I want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if I want to have a relationship with God, if I want, if I want to have a relationship where I, I learn and I grow, it's got to be a relationship uh, much the same as I have with my best friend on earth which means I can't be the only one talking. Mm-hmm. 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 And for mm-hmm. years, I was the only one talking. Mm-hmm. And I would sit down and say, God, come here. Okay, let me tell you. And I'd, I'd tell him, and I'd talk to him, and I'd praise him, and I'd tell him, and then I'd say, okay, all right, thank you, God. See you later. And, and when you think about it, how long would our friends stay around us <laughs> if we never <laughs> let them talk? That's true. If we never let them talk. And so a connection... To wisdom, buddy, has been for me uh, to read and to to find times, especially early in the morning before my mind gets cluttered with mm-hmm. emails and stuff like that, to sit and be quiet. You know, one of the most productive people I've ever studied in my entire life is George Washington Carver. Uh, he's just a true hero of mine. And, and Carver, if you one of, one of the things that will strike you right off the bat about his life is how in the world could anybody accomplish this much in a lifetime? Mm-hmm. I mean, in five lifetimes, how could anybody accomplish as much as he did? And yet, one of the things that he said when he testified before Congress, they asked him, how did you, how did you come up with the stuff of the peanut? And, he, and his answer was basically, I get up early and I go out every day before the birds get up. And I walk outside, and I get my marching orders for the day. Mm-hmm. And I ask what I'm supposed to do and what I'm supposed to look at, and I'm quiet. And so I, I, you know, I don't know if that was the answer. No, that, wanted, that definitely was. I think we went through um, 21 days of prayer and fasting at Church of the Highlands a couple months ago, and he talked about, and, and you led into this perfectly, and I had no idea that it was going to go this direction, but he talked about principles of the first. Everybody knows you're supposed to tithe when your money comes in. But your time is, like, the biggest battle I face every day, it's not running around on my wife. It's not doing drugs. It's not going to bars. It's can I do my devotions before I check my email? Right. Can I do my devotions before I check my text? 
And it is mental warfare. It is, like, it is will, a struggle. I it will is. wake up and want to say, oh, I have, there's Facebook notifications. <laughs> Did something happen last night? Right. And then I, some days I get it right, and some days I look and cheat, and then I go, but there is, there is a principle, and it's, it's biblical, about giving God your first, and you just address first. it there. So, right. unbelievable. If there's... If there's ten people better than Andy Andrews out there right now, I want to see him. Oh God! Bring bring him in. I'm just hey, listen. Don't wait a minute. Don't don't get my wife in that conversation. <laughs> you know something you said kind of stuck with me because uh, of George Washington Carver. You know that one of my favorite quotes is Martin Luther. He said, "I spend an hour every day in prayer, except when I get really busy, and then I spend two. And it's kind of going back to what BJ was saying. Like our time is the only thing you can't get more of. You can always make more money. You can do all kinds of things to get things right. back, but you can't get your time. And so if time's kind of the measure, of what he's saying, of our devotion to God. And sometimes you get so busy, like with everything else you're doing, you forget. And it sounds like what you're saying when you get your priorities straight, that's when everything else kind of comes together. And if God's the center of our time, then he can kind of from that make everything else be blessed. Yeah. And another, another prayer that has helped me, he didn't ask this, but I feel like I should say this. Uh, it is a prayer that I saw David pray one day because I had a real problem with myself a few years ago and and my prayers because if I was really honest with myself, I realized, you know, I grew up in church. My dad was minister of music at Shades Mountain here, and I grew up with Dr. Carter and, and I, in Dothan with Harper Shannon there, Chris, and and, um, you know, I, I grew up knowing, you know, God, your will be done. Please, mm-hmm. your, I want your will, right. Lord, your will. My life. And But I realized some, some years ago that, I, that in reality, if I was really honest with myself, that, that my prayers were kind of like, you know, God, your will be done. I want, you know, whatever your will is, Lord, that's what I want for my life is your will. And then I would get up and go, and I would kind of think, but, but don't. Don't touch my kids <laughs> because if something happens to my kids, God, we're going to have a problem. Mm. You know, and, and, you know, Lord, I want your will. I want your will, Lord, please, your will. And also, before I die, I would like a boat. I would really <laughs> like a boat. You know, is it your will that I get a boat, God? And, and, I, and it, it bothered me because I realized uh, deep down, I, I guess I didn't really want God's will. And, and I struggled with that for a while, but I read Proverbs and Psalms every day, mm-hmm. and I saw mm-hmm. in Psalms, you know, it's David, here's the biggest screw-up in the world, man. I mean, if, if, if they had had Xanax back when David was writing Psalms, we wouldn't have Psalms. Mm-hmm. You know, this guy's happy, he's sad, he's excited, <laughs> he's depressed, he's, he loves God, he, you know, God loves him, God hates yeah. him. I mean, it's just crazy. <laughs> and, and yet, he was the man after God's own heart. That's what God said. Well, I saw in there one time he, he prayed. He said, God, help me to want your will so that I can follow you more closely. And I realized at that point, I thought, wow, God, uh, David knew he didn't want God's will either. Get, David knew his, his mind was running crazy with him, too. And, God, and he said, help me to want your will so I can follow you. And so that's why I pray every day. God, help me to want your will mm. so I can yeah. follow it more closely. Yeah. Getting down to the nitty gritty, the desire and the fact that even our desires are should be in control, right. controlled by God. Right. And, all right, you are listening to Andy Andrews, New York Times bestselling author. He's going to be with us for the final 15. Stick with us. You're listening to Yellowhammer Radio. Welcome back to Yellowhammer Radio, Superstation 101.1 WYDE. Andrea Tice in here. Our co-host, the normal co-host, Scott Chambers, will be back on Monday. In the meantime, we have Chris Reed. B.J. Ellis and Andy Andrews sitting in for the past hour and a half with us. This has been a, an incredible experience. We're so happy you could be with oh, us. Thank you for putting up with me. I, I had such a great time. Well, before we go with the last 15 minutes, you've you've covered a wide range of things. But then yet it's also been down to to, if I dare say, two things where you talked about perspective. Right. Right. And um, gosh, my mind just hope. I hope, hope that's right. Hope and perspective. Now. I'd like to ask you about that in, in applying it to our national situation. Okay. Uh, in the, f- the fact that we've had a presidential election fairly recently. Did we? Yeah, we did. did. I didn't yeah. notice. Yeah. yeah. And all that led up to that and all that's happened afterwards. Right. And just in. Y- By the way, I'm, I, are, are we proud of Cliff? We are. Yes, yes, we are. Oh my gosh. Very yeah. proud. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> 
Yes. So anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> I find myself every now and then just texting him just to yeah. just because I can. Are you still there? Are you really there? <laughs> just thinking he might be standing in the White House I know. when he gets that. So I'm going to throw this in here real quick since he alluded to that. Did you guys see the story that Yellowhammer did about uh, Trump pulling the kid out of the crowd? Yes. Yeah. And the Briarwood. The kids from Birmingham. Yes. We had the Cliff's cell phone footage from behind Trump. All the other news cameras were facing Trump, and we had the one behind it. It's right. like, wow. Cliff is two feet from him. I'm like, that's awesome. He's like, it's really not. <laughs> like, I'm <laughs> with him every day. <laughs> like, it's not. So, yes, we're super proud of Cliff. Okay, good. Wow. But we got, yeah. we've got the special angle. We've got the better yeah. the angle that nobody else Did had. he set it up? For the Briarwood kids to meet with Trump, no, it just happened. Yep. It wasn't did, Cliff yeah. wasn't involved at all. No. It's because Birmingham is the magic city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, magic. I mean, that was just wow! What a an incredible timing on that mm -hmm. for that to mm -hmm. all come to pass. Anyways, all right. So you mentioned cultural. You mentioned thinking. We want to apply it to cul the culture that we're in right now. Right. And there seems to be kind of a bifurcation, maybe, of thinking because we seem to be polarized. Right. Can you? N what, what's your observation? Well, you know, there are, our thinking, it, we talked a few minutes ago about our choices determining where we end up yes. in our life. And so so that is basically saying that our, uh, you know, where, if we say where we ended up, that is our culture. That's where we've ended up, okay? And so you could say that our choices have determined where we've ended up, and that is true. But the truth is mm -hmm. that our thinking has determined where we end up because our thinking has determined our choices – our choices, what do they choose? They choose an action. Actions create results. Results over time, that's our reputation, that's who we are, that's our culture. Yes. And so there's our thinking that has created our culture. And and so when you when you look at that and you realize <clears throat> that we want the best, right? And don't we? I think we do. Yes. I think we want the best. If you, if you ask somebody, do you want the best for your country? Do you want the best for your family? I, I think whether somebody is an atheist, whether somebody is a Democrat, a Republican, a Christian, a Jew, mm -hmm. I don't care what they are. Do you want the best for your family? Yes, I do. Do you want the best for your – yes, I do. Okay, the best is a curious – it's a, it's a curious concept mm. because the best is like the truth. The best and the truth, it's only one thing. There can be different categories, okay? But but we're not talking about some of the best. We're not talking about the among the best of all time. We're talking about the best. Well, the best, it's one thing. And so when you see people who disagree, there's there's one of two things going on. Either there is a difference of opinion— Okay, and, you know, Chris likes green carpet. I wanted blue carpet. Okay, there's a difference of opinion. Now, it doesn't really matter that much because you can compromise on a difference of opinion. You can mm -hmm. compromise on that sure. because we can just go teal. We can duke it out <laughs> backstage. We'll go teal in front of everybody else, and teal will work. Neither one of us really like it, but it'll work. Okay, it's an opinion. Now, so two things going on when people disagree. One is, well, there's a difference of opinion. And if there's a difference of opinion, it's really usually no big deal. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that's going on when people disagree is somebody doesn't know the truth. Because if we're going to get to the best and the truth, it's, it's one thing. And so the, the reason you can compromise effectively on, a, on, a, on an opinion, but you cannot compromise on a principle. Mm -hmm. Because you, you know you can you can comp you can say you compromise if you want to you can you can sign regulations that you can you can say well I can't go 100 percent gravity I know you know I know that mm -hmm. that used to be what we did but today with the gadgetry that we have with the technology that we have and the way people feel about gravity I you know it would be fine to to regulate 75 percent on that but I can't go 100 percent well you can sign whatever law you want. But if you fall off a cliff, you ain't going three-fourths of the way down. Mm -hmm. You cannot yeah. compromise with the principle. Right. And so <clears throat> the, the idea of the thinking toward <clears throat> the truth and the best and what we end up has got to be, got to be gauged on, on the truth. And it's only back-and-forth dialogue where, where people will listen. Uh, and, and we have a place in, in, our, in our American discourse right now where people aren't listening and so we have to somehow 
it, it, it just somehow show a way that people will listen. This is part of what I've tried to do in this book, the little things, to explain things. One of the things I've explained in this book is about taking an offense, about mm-hmm. what happens when we take offense, what happens when we are offended. And see, we live in a society today that, that is absolutely obsessed with how people feel. And yet that is the most dangerous lie you can let your children or our society grow up with because in reality, nobody really cares how you feel. They only care what you do, how you act. You know, in reality, since you, since time began, our, our system of economics, our system of relationships, nothing happens according to how people feel. It's, it's, it's from the time you were a little kid, Chris, every girl who liked you, every teacher who gave you the benefit of the doubt, it wasn't how you felt. And your parents didn't say, well, we, you know, we can't punish Chris anymore because it makes him feel bad. You know, your teachers no. didn't say, well, we can't, <laughs> we, we can't give him C's anymore. It makes him feel bad. It, right? I mean, there, there was no time in your adult life that you ever interviewed for a job and somebody said, so if I give you the job, how are you going to feel? Nobody cares. No. You know, our, our system of relationships and our system of, of economics is according to what you do. This is why manners matter, all right? It's what you do. And to help people understand that offense, it's a feeling. It's a feeling. And nothing is less important than how you feel. You, you, can, you know, The most important thing that you can understand is that you have been created by God with a will that is stronger than your emotions. You really can choose how to act despite how you feel. Mm. And this is one thing I want to make sure my boys know before they get out of the house. You can choose how you act. Your will is stronger than your emotions. You know, we need people to act according to the truth. And, and this, And people say, well, that's just the way I am. No, it's not. I mean, how many times have you been, you know, sitting at home and arguing with somebody? How many times have I told you, we've gone over this, over this and then the phone rings and we go, hello. <laughs> yeah. And we will immediately choose how we act. <laughs> right. For somebody, we don't even know who's on the other end of the line. Listen, there's a, a lot of this. And these, these are little things that are, make a difference. I'm excited about this book. I, you know, and I'd love for people to join me at andyandrews.com. Uh, but the book is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, any, anywhere and I, I just want to say again, I know we're coming to the end of this, and I, I want to say again how much I appreciate you guys, how much I appreciate the work that you guys do for, for the state in which I live. And and I just I really appreciate the example that you guys have set. It's a young crew that is entrepreneurial, that is taking responsibility, and I point my boys to you guys all the time, and I appreciate you so much. Wow. So awesome. So, uh, thank you for that. And, again, if there's 10 better than the guy sitting right in front of me, I want to see them. <laughs> you know what I'm thinking, BJ? We might do the whole country a service if we take a big box full of these books and send them up to Congress <laughs> <laughs> and force them to be distributed. No at every, uh, we, we, no might, we might be able to affect some change that, that way alone. Well, we'll see. I hope you guys like the book. I, th- I think you will. I, yes. can't, I can't wait to read it. Not only... Did he bring books? And I don't know if Big Dave has given them all away. He gave them away. Sorry, right. guys. Were they good jokes? Oh, yeah. They good. were real good. <laughs> That's important. Yes. But he also brought grapefruits from his backyard, and I juiced them. This guy here, I mean, could can he, you say enough good things about him? Could he get any homier? I know. <laughs> <laughs> it? I Alabama grapefruit. Not, yeah. not only grape juice. But he brought a juicer, so he, he thought of everything. He, he took care of the details. He really, <laughs> he the little Those things. Little things. <laughs> Those yeah. little things were uh, accounted for. Unbelievable. And Listen, if if you tuned in and your wife needs to hear this or your husband or your kids, we're gonna, we'll are gonna we transcribe this. We're going to put it out on yellowhammernews.com. The whole interview will be up tomorrow. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank um, you, Andy. Thank what you. a blessing. Amazing. Oh, You're amazing. Incredible. Honor to be here with you all. Well, we, we are so glad that we had Andy Andrews on board for the past two hours, and um, it's a memorable moment. And you got to listen to it here on Yellowhammer Radio. We're going to sign off and catch you tomorrow. <laughs>